Mendelspod.com Advancing life science research, connecting people and ideas. Welcome to a special edition of Mendel's Pod. In May of this year, the California Life Sciences Association, or CLSA, officially launched as the leading voice of the life science sector in California. This new organization is the result of the merger between Bay Bio and the California Healthcare Institute. Leading the new CLSA is Sara Radcliffe. She's formerly from the Biotrade Organization in Washington, where she was focused on policy. We join Sara at her office in South San Francisco. For more than a decade, Competitive Group has helped science-based companies build and execute innovative marketing campaigns. They love science, they love marketing, they love the idea of combining the two to make great things happen for your marketing communications. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for inviting me. So biotech is booming in the state, in the country. Mm -hmm. Where, what do you see as the role for CLSA? Is that similar to Bay Bio? Uh, no, actually. It's different also from the role of the California Healthcare Institute. So California Life Sciences Association, as you said in the introduction, is the first statewide association for the life sciences in California. Right. We've always had Bay Bio in the north, Biocom in the south. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and California Healthcare Institute was a statewide association, what, but it focused on health. What did they health. do? Uh, California Healthcare Institute uh, was uh, a premier policy and advocacy organization. Uh, they were statewide. They focused on health. California Life Sciences Association brings together the strengths of Bay Bio and the strengths of the California Healthcare Institute. And so uh, we, as I said, are the first statewide voice for the life sciences sector. We uh, are an umbrella for uh, life sciences organizations that are drug, device, biotech, diagnostics companies, um, research institutions, public and private, degree granting and non-degree granting. Uh, we have uh, organizations that are in healthcare, in industrial and environmental applications, in food and agriculture. We have companies from the very smallest to the very largest. And so we are proud to be able to say that we are advocating for the life sciences sector across California and at the national uh, and local levels as well. So let's get into policy. Sure. What issues are you focused on right now? Uh, well, there are so many. Um, if I think about those that rise to the top, yeah. I would say, uh, first of all, value of innovation and access to care. And we can, we can go into depth on any of these issues. Yeah, value um, of innovation. Sure. Yeah. Well, just to sort of give you the, the big picture, maybe, of things hmm. that we're working on. Um, precision medicine rises to the top for us. Um, the 21st Century Cures Initiative at the national level, uh, patent reform in Washington, um, and then the repeal of the medical device tax. So speaking um, specifically about the value of innovation and access to care, um, we see an increasing trend among stakeholders, uh, the press, legislators, payers, uh, to question the value of medical innovation, to um, really, in what yes, way? Yes, yes. Well, What's an uh, the, w the the claims that are being made is that these innovations are not worth the prices that hmm. are being charged. It's really a debate over rising healthcare costs. Right. So, yes. are you talking specifically about drug prices then, right now? Uh, that's where the focus has very much been recently. But I think it's really about the value of innovation generally. Mm. Um, the life sciences, I think, really comes under scrutiny because the time uh, that it takes uh, to develop a product is very lengthy. The risks that are associated with that are very high. And in an environment where the timeline is long and the risks are high, uh, it takes a great deal of money to get yeah. through the process. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, yes. we've covered this a lot on our yes. program. Yeah, and uh, I'm so we're we're the media side that's very <laughs> I know <laughs> pro life <science. laughs> and yes. um, so it's fun for us to kind of drill into some of these um, you know examples. Yes. Okay. Yes. And 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 I'm curious where you're feeling some pushback or questioning of the value of innovation. 
Well, we have here uh, in California next year, we expect a ballot initiative, which would be extremely detrimental to the industry. It would effectively exert price controls on our industry. Um, and mm. that is uh, an approach which has never worked. Um, it looks good on paper, but it is not good for patients. Ultimately, um, our industry mm. is uh, ready to be held accountable for the value of its products. We want to make products that are useful and valuable to patients and consumers. Um, and so uh, the, the piece that troubles us is that, for example, the ballot initiative, um, some legislation that we see in Sacramento around so-called drug price transparency tends to focus on the costs and not on the value. And that's why we as an industry have to do our part to make sure that the value of these innovations is clear so that the debate can be balanced. So how will you make that argument? Sure. I mean, in so, a nutshell, I know it's a year's worth of work. Yeah, oh, it's, it's a long process um, because, as I said, when somebody sees that a product, um, the, the typical thing that's, that's said uh, by our opponents is this little pill costs $84,000. Uh, that is just so extraordinarily Gilead's misleading. Gilead's probably one of your members. Uh, yes, indeed. They are. They are. And they're not the only company which has uh, been accused of, of uh, charging high prices. So the, uh, the argument that we need to bring to the public, again, is about the value of these products. There are two sides. One is to really make sure people understand how difficult and how lengthy that process is. So that if you have to put $2. billion into the production of a new medicine, uh, you do need to get a return. But then beyond that, you are trying to sustain innovation into the future. Um, we believe that, uh, again, the system should identify and reward value, but uh, there is a lack of public understanding of really what that takes and of the very negative implications of some of these legislative initiatives for investment into our sector. We are sitting right here in the Bay Area um, in a hotbed of innovation in the tech sector, and we all love that. I support that because I love my mobile devices. Uh, but um, when it becomes much easier to invest in the latest mobile device than it is to invest in the next cure for cancer or the next cure for multiple cirrhosis or rheumatoid arthritis, that is going to have a terrible impact on innovation going forward. So that's the argument we need to bring to when the public. When it's easier to invest in a mobile device yes. than yes. in a cure for cancer. Yes, that's right. Did I say more difficult? No, no, no. Well, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, yes. no. I just wanted to yes. clarify that. Yes. So, and yes. you feel like that's the case now, or uh, it could well, be the case. Well, fortunately, or? as you said, the biotech sector is booming, but we go through uh, uh, cycles like every other industry, and we are concerned that these initiatives will build support for legislative and regulatory initiatives that really um, limit the appeal of our sector to investors and mean that great entrepreneurs turn their attention elsewhere. And so even when our sector is, uh, is really going through a pretty good time period, we need to focus on making sure that that innovation continues. This is actually really hot in the news this week mm -hmm. with the yes. Turing Pharmaceuticals. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it's really yes. spread around Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, it was started by a hedge, former hedge fund person, young guy, yes. and yes. Um, and he bought a pill, mm -hmm. and it's you know from a, a pharma company that didn't want it anymore. Yeah. Turned around and uh, jacked the price up five thousand mm percent. -hmm. And I understand Bio has ejected them from their members. <laughs> <laughs> um, that doesn't yes. help. Yeah. Does well, so, you know, I, I'm not familiar with Turing Pharmaceuticals. I don't know that particular CEO, and that company was not one of our members. Um, but I think it's very clear that oh, they his... Were. No. Uh, but it's very clear that um, he and the company were not uh, prepared to talk thoughtfully with the public about what it takes to develop a drug. No, he wasn't. Um, I think it's widely recognized that his interactions with the press um, and with other stakeholders were unprofessional um, and, and frankly didn't reflect the values of the rest of our membership, our companies, and the seriousness with which we take these issues. 
Um, I think we cannot be offended to be asked why a product is expensive. That's a very reasonable question. We have to come up with the answers. And uh, he, he was not ready to engage in that debate with the public, which is very unfortunate because now it's become sort of people, people view it as uh, an example of the way our industry behaves, and I would very strongly reject that. Um, yeah. our, our members are very concerned to make sure that we are constructive players in this debate. I agree with you. Yeah. So precision medicine, you mentioned yes. that. Yes. Um, diagnostics has had a tough go of it. On the one yes. hand, it's got incredible promise. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I know the pitch has been made on Capitol Hill, and it's, and it's heard. And mm -hmm. now the president has his precision medicine initiative. Yes. This yes. last week we got the report from the working group. So mm -hmm. that's moving along. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in this, you know, there's a 21st century cures initiative, which has passed the House. It's in the Senate. Mm -hmm. I know that has to do with helping to reimburse on diagnostics. So the promise is incredible, but these labs cannot get paid that well. Sure. What well, can we do that? Um, first of all, there are the reimbursement challenges. There are also the regulatory challenges. So yeah. this is an area where the uh, regulatory and reimbursement systems have not kept up with the extraordinary science. Um, we are certainly working on that. Uh, on the regulatory front, we have um, produced a report looking at uh, the regulatory environment for the diagnostic sector. Oh, you have? Um, yes, and, and we'd be happy to share that with yeah. you. Um, and as far as the reimbursement environment is concerned, I, I think people have gotten used to the idea that a test uh, will be cheap. Um, again, it reflects a misunderstanding of what it takes to get to a test, particularly in an age where now uh, what's so wonderful about these tests is that they enable us to amalgamate a lot of complicated data and then you have to take that data and develop an algorithm uh, that that enables uh, physicians to understand what the test is saying and you have to convey that to patients um, so the promise is huge uh, but in order to make this work, again, attractive to entrepreneurs, attractive to companies that can bring a product to market, attractive to investors, uh, the recognition has to be there that this is a, a complicated activity uh, that does take resources to affect. So um, I, again, I think it's telling the story of the innovation, the promise. It's telling the story of uh, what it takes to get these kinds of products through the regulatory process and through the reimbursement process so that we can make sure it continues to be an attractive place for uh, work to continue. So how do we tell this story of the value of innovation better? Well, I think we have to do a number of things. First of all, we have to uh, talk to the public more about the length and complexities of drug development. So. Um, it is very easy when, uh, when I think people see a pill and they think it costs $84,000 to be concerned about that. But that is very, very misleading. It is not that the pill costs $84,000. It is that the research and development process to get to that product, counting the cost of failures, uh, is it costs about $2.5 billion and lasts something like 12 to maybe 20 years. Um, so we have to tell that story. But that's, uh, that's not all. Um, it is returning the investment to the company, but it's also sustaining innovation into the future. And so we have to help people understand the promise of the science. What are we trying to do here? Um, we are at a time period in history where there is extraordinary uh, potential in the life sciences sector and in health uh, specifically as one thinks about the convergence of the sequencing of the human genome, better understanding of genomics and metabolomics, and then digital health and the uh, uh, me uh, methods for managing big data. And so when you bring all of those things together, uh, you are creating an entirely different landscape for healthcare in the future. If we think about the precision medicine initiative that was started by Governor Brown and is now under the leadership of President Napolitano with the University oh, This was of California. California's own version of right yes. after the national. Yes, absolutely. Um, of course, we wish that there were more there was more money um, it was three, allocated to it. Three million. Or That's right. It yeah. was three million. Uh, but you know, three million is a great start. 
um, what is uh, what they're doing with that three million is to fund some specific projects that will further precision medicine, um, and also lay the groundwork, a kind of a framework for what we are all going to do next. The University of California system and other universities working with the private sector um, to really develop specific deliverables and develop the, division, the vision for what we can do going forward with precision medicine. Mm. So how will they collaborate? Has that been worked out yet? Uh, yes, so there have been a number of workshops bringing together um, the University of California system and great entrepreneurs and institutes with ideas. They are picking among those ideas. Mm -hmm. um, they are also picking specific therapeutic areas to work on to develop, again, deliverables for um, demonstrating how precision medicine can work going forward. Uh, and they have reached out to us to really recommend new projects, to get advisors onto their advisory groups. Um, and so uh, it really has been a great collaboration, and we look forward to more. Telling the story of the value of innovation mm -hmm. more, yes. precision medicine we talked about, mm -hmm. what else uh, rises to the top? Well, for one thing, we have an associated 501c3, the California Life Sciences Institute. Um, and we work hand in hand with the Institute. It's headed by my colleague, Lori Lindbergh, uh, as executive director. And they focus on entrepreneurship, education, and career development. So, on the entrepreneurial side, uh, just as an example of the wonderful work they do, they have something called the Fellows All Star Advisory Team. Uh, and that uh, FAST team provides an eight to ten week intensive uh, advising um, program for uh, entrepreneurs who've been chosen through a competitive process. And it is very competitive to get in. Um, hundreds of uh, hours of advising have been donated free by our experts here in the Bay Area, and we really hope to extend that program across the state. Um, we work on education, so STEM education at the graduate, um, undergraduate, and high school level. Um, a great example of the work we do there is the Biogenius program, and so we honor we talk to some of the honor young, young students. students who Amazing. have great science projects. It's just such a, a joy yeah. um, to see this this uh, work that they do and to honor them. And then uh, career development. So we offer workshops. Um, we offer networking opportunities. We work on issues like uh, diversity in the workforce, and we have produced reports on mm. that and uh, I got a new one for you there. Oh, really? Yes, I just had someone on the program recently who has an autistic daughter. Yes. And yes. so he's out there advocating for more acceptance there. Yes. There's yes. And so much his daughter more can do. Help she's just for, finishing mm -hmm. high school. Yep. And there was a lot of support through high school bay. Now the concern is when you get out into the workforce. Right, absolutely. I too have friends with autistic children and uh, autism is an area where um, not that I'm an expert, uh, but it's an area where yeah. people are really capable of learning and of contributing a great deal. It's really a difficulty with communicating with others, and so absolutely, I'm very And supportive I think of that. a changing view society wide yes. Yes. as we learn more about it yes. and the whole spectrum. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, we're all going to work you really hard yes. out here. Yes, absolutely. Um, welcome to the Bay Area. Thank you very much. Thoughts, initial thoughts uh, after being here nine months on the difference of the system out here, the, the context from Washington? Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, it's a much more laid-back environment, um, and that's enjoyable for me. Washington is uh, Washington can be quite a staid environment in its own way, so I'm, I'm enjoying that kind of atmosphere here, the entrepreneurial atmosphere. Um, it's also, uh, for me, wonderful to be able to focus on the activity of growing the life sciences ecosystem. So I had this wonderful job in Washington, D.C., focusing on policy. My heart is still there, uh, and, and I love the policy and advocacy. But the ability to uh, come out here and really work with entrepreneurs, to watch them as they refine their pitch, um, to listen to them being advised by our experts here in the Bay Area, um, to really be in touch with the emerging businesses and see the kinds of ideas that they're putting forward. Uh, that is just terrific. And so 
I, uh, I miss my team in Washington, D.C. I sometimes miss the city. Um, of course, it's a city where major national events occur, and it's always exciting to be in a capital city and see the president's motorcade go by. Um, but California is just so beautiful. Um, I cannot wait to get out and explore the state from, a, from the perspective of enjoying its natural beauty, from the perspective of talking more with all of our companies across the state. And so it's been a great move for me. Um, frankly, uh, apart from missing people, I have not looked back. Would you call yourself an activist? An activist? <laughs> um, I don't you know. Said there's you really probably love the policy. There's probably uh, there's there's a lot of baggage associated with the word activist. Yeah. If what it means is somebody who's passionate about making a difference, then I'll be an activist. Sara Radcliffe, CEO of the California Life Sciences Association. Thank you. Thank you very much. For more than a decade, Competitive Group has helped science-based companies build and execute innovative marketing campaigns. They love science. They love marketing. They love the idea of combining the two to make great things happen for your marketing communications.